Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of ESG Decoded. I am Yvonne Harris, and I am joined today by Kim Nelson. Kim, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Yvonne. Yeah, thank you for being with us today. Um, so to our listeners, Kim spent much of her career focused on government issues at the local, state, and federal levels. She worked for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for 22 years in staff management and executive roles. In 2001, under President George W. Bush, she was appointed to an executive level position with the USPA, where she served as assistant administrator for over four years. For the last 15 years, Kim has been focused on government solutions, working closely with Microsoft partners, building cloud-based solutions. And today, Kim is Chief Operating Officer for True Elements. So Kim, I am very excited about the time that we will spend today Talk to us about True Elements. What does that organization, your company, do? Thanks, Yvonne. Um, True Elements is an early stage company focused on water intelligence. And so you might ask yourself, well, what exactly is that? What we try to do is we actually try to provide intelligence that clarifies water and watershed complexity to help leaders make more accurate, effective decisions to address the water challenges they're facing today. And as you know from reading the news, there are a lot of water challenges out there. So, Kim, True Elements built what they call the world's first water quality forecasting platform. Sounds intriguing. was a little bit of a tongue twister for me. Can you tell me more about this important solution? Sure. So what True Elements does is we aggregate and normalize many, many different types and layers of disparate data. That means we take data from all different sources, government sources. Once we aggregate and normalize that data, we use it to produce deeper, clearer, more holistic insights into watershed dynamics. And then we turn those insights into clear visualizations and scores. Think of scores between 70 and 100. Right. This makes it much easier to understand complex information because we're all used to getting scores from school. We know 95 is pretty good, right? 98 is even better. We know 70, not so good. So by creating, taking all this complex data, putting it on a map and putting a score with it, it makes it much easier for people to understand complex data. Then they can use that data for a more reliable analysis. They can use it for forecasting. They can use it for decision making. That's what our water quality forecasting platform is about. And I can talk a little bit more about what those forecasts are. We do both short-term forecasts and long-term forecasts. A short-term forecast, for instance, would be, hey, the water quality in the river today that we're using for drinking water maybe is a 95. But how many times have you walked along a river on a beautiful day, it's clear, blue, it looks great. And then a couple of days later, after a major storm, it doesn't look the same. It's muddy, it's opaque. Well, that water quality isn't nearly as good because of all of the runoff that occurred. So that's a short-term forecast. We can look at weather and say, the water quality today, maybe a 90. Two days from now, after they're a big storm, maybe it's going to be a 78. And then we do longer-term forecasts, climate-related forecasts that might go out decades saying this particular neighborhood, this particular facility, 30 years from now, because of more intense storms, more frequent storms, it's going to be subjected to flooding or other impacts from weather. Kim, I'm picking up on um, maybe an artificial intelligence and AI interface or component to this platform. Can you tell us about the role that AI plays in your solution? Uh, it plays a big role in our solution. AI, artificial intelligence, is at the, the core of what we do. We use it in the beginning to fill in gaps in data. I talked about how we collect a large amount of data, we aggregate it, and we normalize it. Well, what that means is when you normalize data, you're comparing different sets of data. And it's unlikely any two data sets are the same. And it's unlikely that they're collecting all the same information. So we use artificial intelligence to fill in the gaps. If you think about artificial intelligence, you know, you use it every day. Maybe you're typing a message and all of a sudden you get suggestions for filling in the words. Well, we do a little bit of that where we have, we look at data sets and we see gaps and we say, hmm, based on everything we know, 
we can fill in those gaps, use artificial intelligence to fill in some of those gaps. Another way we use it is through the creation of what we call virtual sensors. So water sensors are great, and we have data from over 1.5 million sensors that are getting real water quality data from those sensors. But there aren't enough sensors in the country to do all the analysis we want to do. So we create virtual sensors. We basically take a lot of data based on a particular location, everything we know that's happening, and we create sort of a virtual sensor. What would a sensor likely say if it were there? And then we take those virtual sensors and we measure and we measure until the water flows down to a real sensor. And we say, huh, what did our virtual sensor com say compared to the real sensor? And if there's a disparity there, then we use, we go back and refine our algorithms. So that's a couple of ways how we use artificial intelligence. To fill in gaps where data doesn't exist. I love the way you explain it. You definitely keep it simple and demystify it. So that's very, very helpful. Let's um, maybe go bigger picture, Kim, talk more holistically in terms of the product and the solutions that True Elements provides. As an ESG leader, how can I use your solutions to help develop my ESG strategy overall or to help me with some tactics for my already established strategy? Yeah, this is an important area and it's hard to pick up a newspaper, uh, you know, a magazine, your LinkedIn without seeing the words ESG. So let's be clear about what that means is that ESG is usually part of a corporate strategy. The E stands for environment, the S for social, and the G for governance. We pretty much help on the, the E and the G side, particularly the E side, environmental strategies for companies. When you understand from a corporate perspective, for instance, that water is very complex. It's multifaceted. It's ever-changing. And water crisis, like we're seeing, we're seeing what's happening out in the West, right, with, with the droughts. We're seeing flooding. Think of the impact that these crises are having and putting our water resources under great stress. So for a business leader, they're looking at these things happening around them, but they know they need a clear path for better decision-making an understanding of what's the future hold for them. What's the risk to their companies, to their stakeholders, right? To their operations. They have uh, all kinds of risks, reputational risk, operational risk, financial risk. So that's one area where we, we can actually help is we can collect the information. We can tell what the current condition is and we can help forecast. We can help them understand what their risks are going forward. And within the government, there are Many efforts underway today coming out of the Securities Exchange Commission, the Federal Reserve, where there is an expectation that companies will do a much better job of reporting to their stakeholders the risk associated with climate change and water, both having enough water, the quantity, have enough quantity of water as well, the quality of water is a risk to companies today. So that's one area we can help them. The other area I would say is a little bit more of a, on the social side perhaps, is that many companies want to be good stewards of the environment and recognizing that they live in communities where they are using water in a the community. They want to work in partnership and in collaboration to be good stewards of that water resource. So they, they actually have uh, community efforts where they're working together to understand the condition of the environment and to help improve the condition of the environment. There, there's a phrase out there called water positive goals. And that means companies today want to be water positive. You've probably heard the words carbon neutral, meaning you know, you're, you're looking and you don't want to put more carbon into the environment. You want to reduce your, your carbon emissions. Well, it's a little bit different with water. Companies want to be water positive. And what that means is they want to return more water to a watershed than they actually use, particularly in distressed watersheds. So that's one of the areas we can help them with these efforts where they're working collaboratively in communities to better manage a watershed and to become water uh, to help drive water positive goals. We can help them understand that and provide a platform 
for collective action where they're working with community groups so everybody can see what's the condition in the environment today of the water? What's it going to be in the future? What are our goals for that? And then we can help them see and measure their progress towards those goals. A lot of great things um, that companies could definitely lean on your organization for um, support and for help. We're going to include, Kim, the link to True Elements, the website, in our show notes. So we encourage our listeners um, to go go check out True Elements and the services they provide. And as Kim discussed, there's connections to the E and the S and the G all in um, their work. But, but Kim, I, I really want to spend some time, too. I'm very interested in your career and your path to where you are now. So can you talk a little bit about um, maybe the earlier time in your career and how you pivoted to this role as an ESG leader with True Elements? I guess careers are often uh, maybe not straight ladders. They're more like a meandering river, if you, ha- if you will. So here I am with a, with a technology company. Before I joined True Elements, I spent 16 years with Microsoft. And now let's be clear, I don't have a technology degree. So here's how I got here. My undergraduate degree is in political science and education, and uh, my graduate degree is in public administration. I always, once I, once I figured out uh, when I was in college that I really wanted to work in government, that was my career. I spent 26 years in government. A large portion of that was actually in utility commission and then in an environmental agency. I worked in the State Department of Environmental Protection in Pennsylvania, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. So working in an environmental agency where almost everyone working there is an engineer or a science, a scientist uh, in a STEM-related field, hydrologists right, and, and, and scientists and chemists, I was not one of those. I was a political science major and a graduate degree is in public administration. So I worked in programs policy, primarily policy, and worked in programs where I really had a curiosity for understanding, were we making an impact on the environment? We were spending billions of dollars, taxpayer dollars, but were we having an impact? So that's how I got into technology, because how are you going to measure impact if you don't collect data? So we had to collect information, we had to collect the right kind of information, and we had to put in place a performance measurement program to understand whether we were actually achieving what the legislature wanted us to achieve. So I got into helping design our computer system so we collected the information we needed to understand whether we're making a positive impact on the environment. So it's a, it's a strange way to get there. Um, I wound up becoming the first CIO ever, Chief Information Officer for the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. I went on to EPA to become an assistant administrator for the Office of Environmental Information, which is also the CIO, all because I think I had a curiosity and a desire to ensure we were, we were making a difference with the taxpayer dollars. Well, it's not a strange journey, Kim. We all have a very unique journey, and I yeah. appreciate the transparency in you sharing yours. There could be someone listening today that's saying, gosh, you know, I'd really like to have a role with an ESG but I'm a poli-sci major or I'm an accounting major. I just don't see the connection. So I know you've just inspired uh, just by sharing your story. Is there anything else in terms of advice or wisdom that you could share with um, our women audience? Maybe um, a young female college student, you know, is thinking about a STEM career or thinking about an ESG career. Just any other advice that you, you know is very powerful now that maybe you didn't receive when you were earlier in your career? Yeah. So, you know, I think there are new opportunities that open up on a regular basis. The jobs that will exist a few years from now, many of them don't even exist today, right? Uh, We live in such a a world that changes so rapidly. So I, I would just say, if you're curious and you have this ongoing curiosity and desire to learn, just keep a, your mind open to new opportunities to use the skills you have in new and different ways. Uh, one of the things that I've learned over the years, mostly from interviewing people where I've been hiring, and, you know, in a management role and hiring people to bring on my organization, I don't look as much at what a person has done in the past 
as I look at what they could do in the future. And by that, I mean, if a person comes to me and says, you know, here's your job, here's the job description, and I've done every single one of these things that's on the job description, that may not be the person I want to hire. I want somebody who's willing to stretch themselves. I want somebody who's willing to say, you know what, 30% of those things I've never done on that job description, but that's okay because I've been successful in the past and I have a desire to learn. I have a desire to grow. I have a desire to do something different because they're going to bring passion to the job. They're going to bring curiosity to the job because they have to, to be successful. I guess that's my advice. When you look at a job description or you look over at what somebody else is doing, don't think of all the things that might be in the job description that you've never done before, but think about all those things that would open up new opportunities to you, that would give you the passion right, to get up and, and work every day. I'm so glad you said that, and I'm glad that you approached it the way that you did, because came from a diversity, equity, and inclusion perspective, research has shown that as women are applying for jobs and looking at job descriptions, we actually do the counter of what you're just describing. We go through the list, right? Yep. And instead of seeing challenges and opportunities, if we can't check 100% of the boxes for the requirements and even their preferred specifications, we count ourselves out oftentimes, even before the employer has a chance to see our resume or our application. I love the way that you frame that in that look at a job description as your next stretch assignment. Right. Yep. And, you know, what do you have maybe relative in your experience? That's a great compliment for those asks. And that's where you focus on your selling points for that interview. You said it very well. That's that's absolutely the case. And that's the kind of person, you know, I want to hire in the future. I right? is the kind of person who's willing to take the risk, who's willing to stretch themselves. It's that learning and growing that's so important. That's where you get the most exciting thinking in an organization. And I guess if we can, um, Kim, I'd love to get some advice for even women who are currently in the field of ESG, um, whether they're in entry-level positions, middle management, upper management, it's still a very male-dominated field. And oftentimes they could be one of very few or the only. Any advice to women who are struggling maybe to have their voice or to make an impact because of uh, the gender um, dynamics in ESG. You know, certainly in, in, in this space and in so many different fields, um, you might look around and you might see that for whatever reason, whether it's you look different from other, most of the other people in the room, and there are lots of reasons you might, you might look differently. I would say find an ally out there. Find, find somebody out there who may also be different for whatever reason and, and build, build relationships. Uh, look for allies who are going to be there who will help you, who will be there for you, maybe when some of the tough conversations take place, who will be your sponsor, uh, who will help you through uh, various parts of, of your career. And know that you know, just bring your best self every single day. Bring your best self. And I am convinced if you bring your best set self every day, you will be successful as long as you work with other people in your organization. Um, it's really important, I think, to, to understand. Um, for instance, I, I try to, to uh, share with people, there are, there are three people you should have in your life or three types of people you should have in your life. You should have a mentor, and you, that mentor should be could be somebody in your organization, somebody in your company, or somebody completely outside of your company. You should have a, a manager who's a good coach, somebody who's coaching you and not simply telling you do A, B, and C, but look for a manager who can act as a coach, and then have a sponsor in your organization, and these should be all different people. A sponsor in your organization be, should be somebody who sort of has your back, somebody who's going to represent you at a higher level decision when decisions are being made about things like promotions or job assignments. Who's that person who's respected within the organization who will be there and be your voice even when you're not in the room, okay? So if you look around and you think to yourself, in my circle, do I have a mentor? 
Do I have a manager who's a coach? And do I have a sponsor in my organization? There are three things that are really important. And then anytime in your in a room with people, virtually or physically, is there somebody in that room that can be an ally for you? And I think if you think about things that way and you bring your best self every single day to the to the job, that you'll be successful. That's really great advice, Tim. And I know for um, many women, um, not only in the space of ESG, but in any organization, corporation, any industry, many of us do have the first two that you described. We have the mentors, we have the coaches, um, and they could be different people, the same a multitude. Um, but where our real opportunity lies is um, connecting to that sponsor or those sponsors. And I love the way um, that you stated it. My definition of a sponsor is a little bit shorter, but who is that door opener? Who's that opportunity maker? Who's that window opener for you? Yep. Um, and I think that um, many of us just need to reflect upon that. And whether we're in current um, organization or looking to make a career switch or a company switch or change, you need to very early on, maybe even in that interview process or that offer process, determine who plays those roles for you in that organization before you even join. Yep. I, th I think they're questions to ask. I remember when you go through an interview process, they may be interviewing you, but you should also be interviewing that person and that organization. Is it the right fit for you? Agreed. It's, it's really a two-way street. Absolutely. Well, Kim, we've recently been recognizing Women's History Month, and so would love to um, just wrap up our time together with some personal reflections from you about Women's History Month. Um, as a part of Women's History Month is International Women's Day, and this year's theme was Embrace Equity. So any thoughts that you may have about equity as it relates to women in the workforce? And tell me about a woman who inspires you. You know, Yvonne, you have all the data, and your and your um, <clears throat> listeners do too, I'm sure, about the um, importance of diversity in a workforce. Right, that the most productive teams are the teams that are diverse, and with that diversity comes the importance of equity. That we have to make sure that everybody is treated equally within an organization and in terms of their pay and in terms of promotions and of rewards and job opportunities and everything, because that again is going to make or break an organization in terms of success. We, we shouldn't underestimate how important that is in any organization. You know, I, I knew you were gonna ask this question about you know, a, a woman who is most influential in my life. And this one's a hard one. This one is a little emotional for me because you probably hear from a lot of people that their mother was the most influential in their life. Um, and, and I'm going to give you that answer, but I lost my mother when I was very young. I lost my mother when I was 16. And I lost my mother because she took her own life. And she did that because her whole life was being a mother. And she didn't have a career outside the home. Her whole life was being a mom. And when something happened in her life and she was no longer going to be a wife and a mother, it was hard for her to go on because she didn't have something else that was her own. Her identity was all about being a wife and a mother. And I guess what I would say is what I learned from that was how important it is to have an identity that is your own. And I have a wonderful family. I have two fabulous daughters. I had an amazing husband. I had an amazing family. But I also have an identity that's my own, and I can stand on my own uh, with my own identity. And whether it's financially, emotionally, uh, I can stand on my own. And... That's one thing I learned from my mother is the importance to have an identity of your own, uh, not based on other people. And I think it's one reason I am where I am today. It was a hard way to learn a lesson, 
but it was an important lesson I learned really early in my life. Kim, just so appreciative of you opening your heart and sharing that. Life is a journey filled with lessons, um, many of which we don't anticipate. Um, but I know that and other things that you've shared on this episode have been points of transformation to those who are listening. The loss of a mother is something you just never get over. It changes you regardless of age. But thank you um, for honoring your mom and mentioning that with us today. I'm, I'm grateful. Well, thank you for having me here today and for this discussion and for everybody who listens in. Thank you. And hopefully you'll come and join us again, Kim. Thanks. I would be happy to do that, Yvonne. Thank you. Thank you.